Thanks to everyone for a great conference, and people are still here on a Friday afternoon. It's excellent. Um, I'm going to talk about some trends that I see in cloud, um, and a little bit about DevOps, and something about microservices. You've probably heard enough about Mesos. I'll talk a bit about Mesos in the middle somewhere, but this isn't a, a what's going on in Mesosphere thing. I think you've probably had two days of that already. Um, I did original version of this talk at GigaOM Structure Conference in May last year and tried to kind of get push a little bit of what I th where I thought things were going. And this is sort of an update for that to say, figure out what did I get right, what did I get wrong, and um, how things have been changing over, over that period. And then a little bit more to talk about the sort of DevOps microservices side sort of on the end. So this is what happens with enterprise cloud adoption. It's one of Simon Wardley's things, where it's basically they ignore it for a while, and then they say no, and they say, I said no, damn it, no, no, and then, oh crap, I guess we have to do it now. And then enterprise IT finally catches up. So Netflix got out a bit ahead of this, and so around about 2009, we went and figured out how to adopt cloud. The rest of the world copied us. And in 2013, 2014, the enterprises really started turning up. And so this is my Twitter icon. They, they called us the cloud unicorns, so I picked that. Um, and then, so I joined Battery Ventures at the beginning of last year, and this is kind of partly because this is what I saw happening. There was this massive influx of enterprises trying to figure out all this stuff at once, and there was a lot of opportunity for startups to get into this space, and it was an interesting time to make this move. So the other thing that happened in 2014, really from the big, when I joined Battery, this was, you know, very few people were talking about this, but by the end of the year, it was a big thing. And that was the rise of Docker. So Docker is something that wasn't on anyone's roadmap for 2014. It was on everyone's roadmap for 2015. It's actually unprecedented how fast Docker arrived. And it sort of turned over a whole lot of things in this industry. And it's sort of interesting now. Everyone's going, this is how you, you know, running Docker containers is actually, you know, how do you do that is now the question, rather than what the hell's this Docker thing, which was the question only like a year or so, a year and a half ago. So I'm talking a bit about public infrastructure as a service, some cloud technologies, how you build your own clouds and run on top of those, and some enterprise SaaS, just to kind of go over this. So what do enterprises want out of infrastructure? They want to know that their vendor that they're connecting to is still gonna be there in a few months or a few years' time. So they want some kind of enterprise support where they, things go wrong, they can shout at somebody. They want enough scale to run their enterprise, which you may quite, you know, maybe not that much scale compared to a big, uh, you know, web scale companies, but, but they need enough scale. And they also care a lot about the location. Where is it physically? Which laws apply to where that data is being stored? And you know, the safe bets right now uh, for a lot of people, it's basically Amazon and Azure. And one of the things about Azure is they used to call it Windows Azure, but they, they changed the name to Azure. And when I went looking for an icon, I couldn't find one. So I modified it for them by sticking some penguins on it. Um, and this is the next con, right? So this is, and it's actually interesting. I think what we've got now with Azure is that they are very, very much embedded in the Linux mindset, but the public perception of that is still lagging. So they, they are, you know, everything they've got is Linux-based. They're doing open source. They were at OzCon the last few years. So, um, but people still think of them as Windows. So that's, that's an interesting catch-up that they're having trouble with. That's one of the reasons that they're lagging, is that people still think of them as Windows, and they are trying to figure out how to get beyond that. Um, and Amazon, at the beginning, you know, 18 months ago, the big enterprises said, okay, we're gonna start playing with this, we'll put a few workloads out there, I think we're kind of ready to go and try this, and we'll get the enterprise license agreements in place and everything. The situation now is they're going, uh, how many data centers can we close? Right. Okay, we can move this data center, and let's close these three and move everything that's in them in, into AWS so that, that it's moved that far on. And it's not, not talking about every enterprise, but the significant number of people are saying, building big data centers is not the differentiator for our business. That was where, Netflix, that was where Netflix's mind was in 2009. You're seeing a lot of people in that set now. So it's, moved, it's moving on every year. So there's this global land grab. This is where all of the AWS uh, locations are. Um, this is where the Azure locations are. There's more of them and they tend to be smaller, but this is largely because the thing that's driving Azure to have a location is typically Office 365 and you know, a government or a big company that says, I need you know, my email to be in this physical location. And Google's in three places. 
um, because they want to be somewhere really cheap, like you know, Taiwan or Finland or Belgium or somewhere. I think that's where they own Iowa. And the thing about net, uh, Google, they have really, really low latency networking on their clouds, except you have to get to Iowa. <laughs> so it takes quite a long time to get to Iowa from where the customers are on the east and west coast. So that, that you know, oh well. But it turns out they do actually have locations in all these places, but they haven't got Google Cloud turned on in them. So you know, waiting for a Google to turn on a few more cloud regions might be interesting. Um, the other thing that um, AWS did last year was they launched in Berlin, and no, Berlin, Frankfurt. And I visited Berlin, I visited the, uh, Germany a couple of times last year. And the first time I went, people said, yeah, there's this cloud thing, we don't really trust it, you have to send your data to, to Ireland, and we don't really trust that. And the next, next time I went, a few months later, it's, of course, everyone has their data in Frankfurt. <laughs> it was like somebody flicked a light switch because you turned up on their doorstep. And it, that's what we're seeing around the world. So the next place that you're gonna see is, uh, that's been announced anyway, is India. And we have AWS going to India. I think you'll see most of these vendors, certainly Azure, I expect to be in India. And, and you'll see them filling out more countries around the world. So that, that's kind of the global land grab in action. Now, people kind of say, well, you need billions of dollars to build these things out. How, how do you compete? Well, there's one counter example, which is quite interesting, which is digital, digital ocean. They are growing, still growing really fast. So when I first did this graph, they had grown about 20 times from from 2013 to 2014. Um, and then one year later, they'd grown, only grown two and a half times bigger. So, you know, all right, they're slowing down a little bit. But they're now the second biggest uh, hosting provider for web-facing computers after AWS. And they're a long way behind AWS, and that's kind of what they specialize in. But this is interesting, because the way they're funding this as a startup is quite different. The, the, the finances and the way they operate is actually an interesting exercise if you actually get to find out, you know, talk to them in detail about what they're doing. It's an interesting problem. But the thing about DigitalOcean is that now your corporate IT department has AWS as the standard thing, and you have the catalog, and it's all very controlled, and you want to just start up a website, so you go and put it on DigitalOcean on a credit card. So the new, the new stealth IT is sort of sneaking around the side of your AWS account and throwing these guys in for, for that you know, marketing website or whatever it was. So if you're trying to build a cloud or you're trying to build technologies that run on cloud, what you care about is agility. How fast can you get something done? The functionality that you can get out of it and maybe how much money you can save by doing that. And so one of the questions is what's happening in the PaaS world? What's happening in the platform as a service world? And I didn't have to change this from last year. There was sort of Cloud Foundry was sort of running away with this. We just heard that they have $100 million revenue. Uh, they're one of the fastest growing revenue open source projects ever. That, that's great. But I think that Docker is sort of disintermediating this space. If you put something in a Docker container, you don't really care which PaaS you're running it on or even whether you use a PaaS. So whereas they kind of had a lock on this space, um, Docker is actually competing with them at that level. It's sort of becoming a commodity to some extent. You can build your own sort of platform around Docker and you don't have to actually use Cloud Foundry. So what we're tending to find is that Docker is interesting because it's selling largely to the developer community and Cloud Foundry is largely selling to the enterprise IT community, you know, the CIO. And there's a very different paths to the, to, into the organizations. And then Docker is getting used differently. This is something I came up with um, sort of just recently. Uh, New Relic uh, launched, and I think it was in March, uh, they started monitoring Docker, and they collected data and they published this in June. And what they found was they measured how long Docker containers live for. And you can see the tallest line on here is one minute. That's the one minute line. The second tallest is the zero minutes line, because they have one minute resolution here. And then everything else is somewhere in the weeds. And once you get beyond one hour, it's, you know, there's a few out there. So what this, this is not the way you people use VMs. It's not the way people stand things up in data sets. This is a completely new kind of workload where probably what's happening is people are creating test environments for long enough to finish running the test and shutting it down, and it takes 30 seconds or two minutes or whatever to run the test. So that's a, it's an interesting new way of looking at you know, what is happening here. Once you containerize things, you make it easy for people to do this, uh, you can get stuff done very quickly. But that has implications all the way through the stack. We saw earlier today, uh, was it today? Verizon, sort of 50,000 containers were started up in a few, few minutes just on, on, on Mesos. So that, that's the kind of workload that people are actually using. That wasn't you know, just a you know, cute demo. And then if we look at in-house cloud automation, um, 
you know, what's happening there? So people were using VMware for the stability functionality, but they started complaining about the total cost of ownership. And it's a kind of starts to look expensive, and so people were looking for ways to, to cut the cost. And the, again, people are somewhat, some people are using Docker for this, some people use OpenStack for this, and some people are using Mesos for this. And I put Mesos on this slide when I first wrote it you know, over a year ago. So I think this is a good prediction to come here and find that there's a lot more people here this year. So I think that um, each of these are operating in a different space. And OpenStack kind of started out saying, we're going to build, build big public clouds with this, but now it's really become the, you know, it's really oriented around replacing VMware or acting as an alternative to VMware. So it's really focused on easy to install, install relatively small installations, you know, with some scalability, but the scalability just has to match VMware. They're not trying to match AWS. The, the real one that scales here is Mesos, and we're seeing that there isn't really a, a good alternative to Mesos for things that can scale to the tens or hundreds of thousands kind of size. So I think that's interesting. And Docker is acting as a, an interesting sort of um, neutralizing sort of um, portability story here, because if you've got a bunch of VMs that were built to run on VMware, you can't just fire them up on KVM. You have to kind of rebuild that 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 VM, and if instead you build it as a container, then you've got your, your whatever snowflake you had to construct in your you know, enterprise data center. Once you've containerized it, you can run that on, continue to run it on VMware, and you can run it on KVM, and you can run it on you know, Xen, on, on AWS, and you can run it on a Mesos thing. You no longer care, because you've encapsulated the software in something that's independent of the VM format. So it kind of neutralizes that VM format war. Um, this is something I, I, I stated like a year and a half ago, that vendors are going to co-opt and fragment OpenStack. And you know, these are all logos where OpenStack and IBM were all in the same GIF file when I found it. Um, they, IBM likes OpenStack so much, they put the O on there three times. Um, EMC's there, Red Hat's there, Dell. HP didn't get the memo. I don't quite know. They have, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing with their logos. Um, I decided to stick OpenStack on top of the VMware logo and Cisco, there's a convenient O there for OpenStack. Um, Azure is actually doing some OpenStack work. Um, Marantis is do doing a lot of um, sort of actually fixing it for people having a nice distribution, so they're doing pretty well, although they don't have OpenStack in their logo. Oracle conveniently also has a nice O in the middle. And then the latest one that come along is Google, bringing Kubernetes to OpenStack. So. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty good. So those are all enterprise or big vendors that are doing stuff in OpenStack. So what happened to all the small people? Well, they all got bought. So um, Nisera got bought by VMware a while ago. Let me see where these are. Like. Eucalyptus, which isn't really OpenStack, but HP, yeah, again, didn't get the memo again. Um, and then we have, where did the next logo go? I, ah, they're popping up here. Oh, cloud scaling got bought by EMC, Piston Cloud got bought by Cisco, or uh, MetaCloud, and then Blue Box got bought by IBM, Nebula, Remains of Nebula got bought by Oracle, it wasn't actually an acquisition, and um, Ink Tank and Innovance got bought by Red Hat, and then Instradius, sort of not really OpenStack, but yeah. So all the large number of the players in this space all got accumulated in. So the current state is OpenStack is the name for enterprise stuff in the data center. That's just a generic brand. Everyone's agreed that it's all called OpenStack and whatever you want to sell in the data center is called OpenStack. So that's kind of my summary for that now. Um, but the problem with OpenStack right now is that it's, other than a lot of corporate infighting that's going on here, because when you have a consortium with all these people on it, everyone can say no, and it's quite becoming harder to, for it to evolve because everyone is sort of squabbling over what to do next. And the other thing is that this is really focused again on, as I said, on how to um, be a lower cost alternative to VMware. You know, more the open source, you know, that's kind of their pitch right now. And that's a very good pitch, and there are useful, very good use cases for OpenStack in that space. But it isn't the, I need to have you know, you know, 10,000 machines in a, in a identically built in a data center to go put something on. And that's really where Mesos has, I think, got some good strength. All right, so what's happening in SaaS? Pretty much everything is moving to SaaS. Um, enterprises are using it, and you can deploy it everywhere. You don't have, if you're a SaaS vendor, you don't have to have a non-premise sales force in every country in the world. You just stand up your service, and everyone in the world can use it. You know, you know, it's obviously more complicated than that, but, but it, it's much easier than it used to be to go global when you have a SaaS product. Um, so 
where's the fastest growth in SAS? What, what's actually happening here, and is it growing? So uh, this is some data I pulled from quid.com, thanks to uh, Kartik Sundar. Um, it's a bit hard to see this, but there's this, that, all of, I, I sorted this by, the, um, by volume over the, over the three and a half years of data I've got here. You can see that the, um, there's a general growth rate, and this is investment. This is VC companies putting money into SaaS startups. This isn't the revenue of SaaS companies. This is the data I had was who, how much are we investing and when? And you can see the application performance and lifecycle management is the top one over this time, accounting, BPM and ERP is second, business process management and uh, ERP, and then sales and marketing startups. And if you go all the way up this, there's a whole lot of different things stacked in here. There's some, there's some you know, it, hiring and analytics and things like that. So it's interesting data, but um, it's a bit more detailed than I have time to go through. So what really happened was in 2014, uh, enterprises finally in, in, embraced cloud and DevOps, and we got some good evidence for that. Lydia Leong of, of Gartner said that year on year, from October 2014 to October, no, 2013 to 2014, um, people, you know, it's like a large change. Uh, everyone's comfortably using it, and uh, AWS and Azure. And then the DevOps Enterprise Summit uh, it's coming up again in October this year, but the first one was last year. Very interesting. We basically got all of the big enterprises and turn up and talk about that agile DevOps, cloud migration, all of those kinds of transformations they were doing. And what really, this really summarized it. The, in order to speed things up, you have to stop top optimizing for cost. And, and Nordstrom summarized it in that way. That was the, the refrain over and over again. And the funny thing is that if you speed things up enough, it costs less. If you optimize for cost, you slow things down so much, it ends up costing more. So you don't get the thing you wanted because you're adding so much process that it gets too slow. If you rip all the process out and go very, very fast, it ends up going much, you end up under, under running your budget and having so, you know, fewer meetings and you need fewer developers to build the thing and it just happens better. So that's the counterintuitive thing that, that came out of this for me. And then uh, Steve Brody said, this is one of the best conferences I've ever been to. And they're running it again. So if you're an enterprise and you're interested in this stuff, DevOps Enterprise Summit is really a unique conference. It's almost all enterprises talking about what they've done. There's very little vendor related, you know, here's the latest product kind of stuff. So what do these enterprise buyers want? What does the CIO want? Oh, you kind of hear this a lot. I need to align IT with the business. Have you heard that one? Yeah. Um, we need to develop products faster. And we need to try not to get breached as well, because there's a lot of that happening right now. Um, and what I call it is security blanket failure. I love this little diagram, um, the little cartoon. So you've got Lin you know, Linus sitting there sucking his thumb and holding his blanket and hoping that that's going to stop him from getting breached. Right? And it doesn't really work that well, because taking an insecure application, putting it behind a firewall, isn't actually good enough nowadays. You have to build security into the firewall, into the application. You've got to encrypt all the, all the person identifiable information, not just the credit card numbers. You've got to make sure that everything is, is very carefully managed and you've got to do penetration tests on your software as part of your build cycle. There's a lot more to be done. So developers are now not just responsible for developing things really quickly, and, and being, are not, not, not just responsible for how much it costs to run them in production because they're kind of getting that, you know, cloud bill directly going to them, but they're also responsible for how safely things run, right? the availability and security of what they're running. Because when you're doing continuous delivery and you're updating something 10 times a day, you're not doing handoffs to operations 10 times a day. That, that's, you can do that on a, maybe a two-week cycle, but continuous delivery where you're doing continuous updates into production, you have to kind of go faster and you have to, find a, you have to own the problem a lot, a lot more. The operators, what used to be called operations, is really now API-driven platform automation, right? And that's where things like Mesos come in. You've got a very powerful API, it's got pluggable frameworks in it, and you've got a, a, a fantastic ability now to build an API-driven platform that can manage itself, that can feedback itself, and do order scaling and, and uh, some, some very sophisticated uh, activities. I'm gonna talk now sort of a little bit more about um, the sort of microservices and product development. If you think about product development, 
one of the things that people do is they assume that if you have a process, it prevents problems. Why would you have a process otherwise, right? You know, if, if, if this thing goes bad, we'll add a process step to check that it doesn't happen again, right? That kind of mentality. And what you end up with is this very slow, very complex, what I call scar tissue processes, right? You know, everything that ever went wrong is embedded in your processes or don't do that. And you have to kind of navigate this complex set of rules and things. And uh, I've heard of some large organizations where just getting a VM provisioned, which should be something that you do self-service, takes months, right? Because you have to go through all the compliance checks and you have to do this and you have to get sign-offs from all of these high, high hippos, high, highest paid person's opinion starts to matter. So there's a whole bunch of things like that. So you go through this whole long process and finally you're, you know, whatever machine that you could have been paying you know, 10 cents an hour for on, on a public cloud or whatever on some infrastructure um, took you thousands of dollars of process to just provision the thing. It doesn't make any sense. So what we're really trying to do with continuous delivery is get around this loop, because every time we get around this loop, we observe what's going on, we orient ourselves, we decide and we act, we're learning something. We're learning something about markets and customers and uh, technologies. And if you do this faster than your competition, then you learn faster and then you're more competitive. So the observe part is really the innovation piece. How do you innovate faster? And then the analysis piece is really big data. So you want to quickly answer questions that have never been asked before. Right? You've got to pull data out of log files. You've got to clean it up, make sense of it, and then get a, get a quick answer to why, is, why are customers not getting through the sign-up page, that kind of thing. Then you've got to be able to decide what you want to do. Company culture matters a lot here. You can get blocked up in this if you have to get too many levels of approval. And then finally, cloud is really the automatic deployment. And what we're talking about deploying in a, in a continuous delivery thing is an incremental feature. It's maybe a day's worth of work for a developer or, or a quick fix. It's not you know, months and months of, of work for a, for a large team. We're trying to get things done quickly, small things done quickly. And then you start measuring customers and you start bouncing around in here and you see what you can build. Now, if you're doing this with a small team, this typically results in, you, know, you build this on a monolithic platform, your Ruby on Rails or your PHP um, um, you know, kind of setup. So you've got a small number of developers, you have a release plan, they work on their stories for, for their sprint and all of that agile stuff, and um, you release it through QA and get to put it in production. Now if you get a bug, it blocks the, develop, blocks the release, and you get bugs there and you find bugs in production, again, you have to roll back. So this blocks a few people. That's okay if you're all sitting in a room and shouting at each other about who broke the thing. Now, if you've got 100 people and you're trying to do this, which is kind of where Netflix was in 2009, um, we found that it was too hard to coordinate the output of hundreds of people into one code base. We would break, everyone was breaking each other's code. No one could figure out what had broken. It took too long to debug. And one of the problems here is you get this thing from QA saying, please, can we have more time to test the release? And so you delay it. Now there's even more stuff in the release, right? The next release, if you, if you have, you know, it's if you take two weeks' work and extend it to three or four weeks, the release got bigger and more complicated and more likely to be broken. So if you ever hear somebody say, can we have more time to test the release, the right thing to do is release more often. Right? Release twice as fast, but half as much stuff in each release, then it's much easier to figure out what broke. And ultimately, you, you take it down to releasing one thing at a time. But these monolithic apps, the, the way everyone starts, it's a monolithic app for small teams, simple systems. And if you've got lots of internal uh, chatter in your application, um, then for efficiency and latency, this is very good too. Now, the problem is that a lot of the time, efficiency and latency is not what we're trying to optimize for. We're trying to get a big team to be more agile and develop things quickly. And that's when uh, microservices come in. So you have lots of release plans, and everyone's developing their own code base, and they're being released independently, and you've got stable APIs across teams. And you can use different technologies. You're not locked into one code base that everything's in PHP or everything's in Java. You can experiment it with other languages. Now, the problem with that is all of these languages have different delivery systems. So you want to have a standard way to bundle them into a release that you can put out in your platform. And nowadays, that's another one of the things that people use Docker for. It's a standardized way to take whatever you happen to have built and figure out how to put it into production. The way Netflix built this was with uh, AMIs because it was targeting Amazon, and it didn't. they basically used mostly a, a, a Tomcat 
server, you know, Java Tomcat server is sort of really the container, but it was wrapped in an AMI and they'd bake everything in and they had a bakery to deliver them. And anything else they wanted, they'd stuff it in an AMI and they could figure out how to deliver it. But nowadays I think that it's much more lightweight to use a, a container for this. Now if you get a bug in one of these and you break it, then all you have to do is to redeploy that one thing. So a small piece of breakage in one service, typically you either roll back that one service, or, but you're not blocking everyone else. So this is, this is the important thing. The, the, the microservices is really a tactic for helping large teams scale, where you've got these more cell-based organizations that are doing, working independently. All right, that, think of it as that. It's not so much a software architecture, it's a result of the fact that you've organized your company differently. Now, this is kind of DevOps circa 2006, uh, which before the word DevOps was, was out there, but this came out of a paper and an ACM interview that um, Werner did in 06, and so this is the model that Amazon had, which was that every developer was on call for everything that they had in production. And this was kind of the inspiration for what Netflix did and other people, so there's kind of two approaches to DevOps. You can either have the developers running everything, and then using platforms to, to run that on. Or you can have DevOps be development operations using common tools and talking to each other and not you know, fighting, right? So there's sort of, there's the, sort of the ops-driven ver version of this where ops people figure out how to develop, and this is a developer-driven one where developers learn how to operate. But if you do this, you have a bunch of developers, they have a bunch of microservices, and let's say one of them broke, and a monitoring tool notices that it broke, and it calls something like, use something like PagerDuty to call that developer. That's really what you want, right? If you can tell automatically that it broke, you don't wake up everybody, don't wake up the SREs who have no idea about this microservice that you put into production that afternoon. You know, who put it into production? Call them, right? Because they know how to roll it back and exactly what state it's in. Um, now, you do have site reliability team, and they're monitoring the overall availability, and they're also looking for externally visible customer failures. Because quite often these microservices fail, and it doesn't. Customers don't see anything, but it's, you know, it's an internal breakage. But if you get a customer visible breakage, somebody has to manage the call and you know, get everyone on the call and go fix it. So how do you do this? A lot of developers go, I, don't, I didn't want to become a developer so that I could carry a pager, right? There's, there's a lot of people that don't like that idea. So how do you do this? Well, if you're a manager and you're trying to implement this, the first pe person that you put on call is the VP engineering. And you get the, all the directors on call, and then you get the managers on call, then the developers, and then the VP engineering says, you know, try not to wake me up. <laughs> I might not be happy about that, right? So, but, but the call tree goes all the way up. And if you've, if this means that systemically, people pay attention to be being on call. Because you don't want to wake your manager up because you screwed up, because you just weren't paying attention, or you left your phone somewhere where you couldn't see it, or whatever. Um, and, that, the other thing is that you don't want to just have one person that knows how something works because you can't ever go off call. So there's a natural inclination here to code review with somebody to the extent that they can take over for you if you're, if, when you go away, right? And uh, typically in a team, there'll be three or four people that know how everything that team's built, all the microservices work, so they can take turns being on call and you're on call you know, one week in three, one week in four, something like that, or maybe a few days at a time, right? But this means that if somebody leaves, people know how the code works, right? But this is the, setting up this call tree, if you do nothing else but set up a call tree like this, the influence it has on your organization will cause all kinds of good things to happen. The, the other thing is it turns out that developers are really good at relate, writing very reliable code that doesn't break when they're on call, right? Uh, and it turns out when it's somebody else is gonna get woken up, they're much less good at that. Right? So it's just about getting the, the feedback loop into the right pain. You apply the pain to the place where it can have the best impact on fixing that pain. So really, just if you do nothing else, try this out, and um, all kinds of good effects start happening. And persuade your VP engineering would be a good idea, and then get them to do it down, down the tree. They can sort of peer pressure it down, or, or I guess not peer pressure, manager pressure. Um, so what we're talking about here is every time we manage to reduce the cost and the size and the risk of change, we've got to speed up the rates of change. And this is, this is the, really the key. And what we're, we're trying to do is, is get everything to go faster. And again, going back to Docker, why, is this so, why did this catch on so fast? It's because it took things that used to take minutes or hours, and it took it down to seconds. You know, compiling stuff in Go takes seconds. Um, Building containers takes seconds. Deploying takes seconds. Your entire build production cycle takes seconds. Why would you do it once a month? You know, something that takes seconds. You can do it you know, 10 or 100 times a day. There's no overhead for doing it. 
Whereas in the old world, it used to be you had to go provision hardware, and everyone, you know, by the time you'd done that, there was a pile of releases, and the release would take a long time to get out. So you had to, if it took weeks to do a release, you could only do it once a quarter, right? So what we've seen here is the technology has caught up to the point where making a release is so lightweight, you should be doing it more often. And this, this is really the key here. And what it really comes down to, if you change one thing at a time, it's really clear what broke. You just make all these small changes, that one broke, okay, wind back that one. Right? You don't have to think, I have 100 changes and I have 10 developers and who broke what and all the interactions. It's much simpler to fix something when you're making one change at a time, but those changes are rolling through really quickly. So this is really disruptive and people that are figuring this out, uh, particularly large organizations that are trying to speed up are really trying to figure this out. And we're seeing many more enterprises sort of working on getting themselves to be more agile than their competition. And to some extent, this, Jerry was here yesterday, he was in the room still. Um, but developer-defined infrastructure is another word for this. And that's another good description, I think, of, of, of what Mesos brings us. So I'll talk a bit about microservices. I mentioned that word a few times. This is my definition of it. Um, Loosely coupled. Well, if every service has to be updated at the same time, it's not loosely coupled. You've, you've got to be able to move things independently. You need stable APIs. You need good ways of doing things. And the other thing is this concept of a bounded context, which is about a 10-year-old idea out of the uh, object-oriented design world um, from Eric Evans. So the idea here is that it's actually simpler to modify a system if you have good, a, a well-defined domain. You don't have to know as much about it. And this actually, people say, well, you know, is it harder or easier to program in a microservice world? It's actually easier because you only need to know how this service works. You need to, I've got four consumers. I've got three dependencies. The rest of the stuff is whatever. I don't need to understand how it works. I've got this very bounded context. You can onboard an, a developer much more quickly. You can get them productive. They can get them to work. They're going to make fewer mistakes because this service does one thing, and it's got a very, very bounded, um, sort of very controlled boundary around it. Whole lot of books. Um, Domain-driven design I just mentioned. Uh, for getting code out, release it. It's a really influential book. Um, In Search of Certainty by Mark Burgess. It's very deep thinking about infrastructure. If you're trying to build a very reliable system, at some point you get left with the really nasty Byzantine failures that gang up on you and they're all different. And in, in Drift into Failure is a good book for understanding how that happens and how to avoid it. Um, some of you may know the Netflix Hystrix software. Hystrix happened basically because I gave a copy of Release It to Ben Christensen at some point, and he read it and went, yeah, we need to implement all these bulkheads and things. So, and uh, it was cool because I got to introduce them at, a, at Michael Nygaard to that, that team at a conference a bit later. Michael was happy that they'd written, a, you know, take the stuff in a book and write code about it is, is a good, good way of doing it. A um, bunch more books here, but Systems Thinking is, is one I added to this most recently. It's a very deep book about how to create these systemic feedbacks in your organizations. So rather than having rules and processes, you create systemic feedback. This whole thing about having everyone on call, that's a system. And the output of that is a whole bunch of behaviors that you didn't have to mandate as processes. Netflix is a very systems-oriented company. The DevOps movement is a very systems thinking approach. So some, if you want some background thinking there, that's a good book. All right, so if you're coupling all of these things together, what happens? You know, what, what are the problems? Well, Conway's law is a law that says that code ends up looking like the company, the organization that built it. And if you are developing microservices and you say, yeah, but half the team is here and half of them are in India and we've got a couple of guys in Prague or something, that's a really, that, that organizationally that doesn't work. What you want to do is say, okay, I have a team in India. They have their own microservice. They have their own API. They're iterating at whatever speed they want. As long as they have a stable API, they can do whatever they want, right? And then that team in Prague does the same thing. So you split up so you have a very tightly bound team building a set of services who are co-located. So you can build a distributed organization, but maybe there is an individual building a service. But you try not to build microservices where the ownership of the service is split across the organization. Another problem you can run into is centralized database schemas where um, you, know, you have to kind of to change, to, you can only release your new set of microservices after you've done the alter table and changed all the schema, 
right? There's too many dependencies hooked in, and the schema is known about in too many places. So what you tend to find is a more denormalized model. Netflix is like 60 or 80 different Cassandra clusters. It's a very denormalized um, database model where every service is owned by, every data source is owned by a different team. Um, and you can get into protocol versioning and centralized service buses tend to, to glue things up and glue things together too much as well. So if we think about this, we used to have these data center snowflakes, you know, very, very individual machines. We'd take months to deploy them, and they live for years. And then we got to virtualization and cloud where it takes minutes to deploy something, uh, and they tend to live for weeks, typically hours to weeks. Um, and then we've got container deployments where it takes seconds to deploy, and as you could see, they live for minutes, maybe a few hours. And then beyond that, we have things like AWS Lambda, where it takes milliseconds to create these things, and they live for, you get charged by the 100 millisecond, and the maximum lifetime's three seconds. That's the way Lambda's set up. So these are extremely ephemeral things. And this is speeding everything up. And if you think about monitoring this, measuring CPU usage once a minute, it doesn't really work. Right. You, you don't, you, you're not sampling this often enough to see what's going on. So this rate of change is actually breaking a lot of tooling. So let's look at some challenges for, for running these platforms. Scale. So it's not just a big, large number of machines. You know, having 10,000 machines in a building is, is, is a hard thing to manage, but you've got continents and regions and zones, and then you've got lots of services per zone. You've got versions of each service you need to manage. You've got maybe lots of containers per version, and then lots of instances, right? So this is a complicated stack of things to deal with, and most monitoring tools and most systems don't understand this. Um, it, it's, you know, we, you can kind of manage one data center at a time. It's pretty typical for most tools, but where's the, I, have a, I want to have a world view of all of my data centers. That, that product is, it, is usually kind of, yeah, it's on the roadmap one day. Um, how do you federate together, you know, 15 different OpenStack clusters, right? They're all separate control planes, the, the federation problem. How do you get, you know, you've got 10 different data centers all running Mesos, how do you glue that together with some federating things over the top? And these are kind of emerging as problems. And then you've got the flow. H how do you measure what's going across these? So there's some diagrams here from Netflix and Twitter showing the flow across their services. And from App Dynamics, some of the APM tools have ways to track the traffic through, through their services, but again, they don't, Typically, they run into scalability problems as the systems get complicated. So you can see this a little bit. You know, you're hitting the edge. You're, you're calling all these different services. Um, but in the end, this is what the architecture diagram looks like. I call these Death Star diagrams. And um, they just have every service you have in a circle with lines between all of them is the best you can do as an architecture diagram. You know, that's, that's a problem. So trying to find ways that we can visualize what's going on in these a bit better. Um, one of the things I've been doing is um, simulating these microservices. So I wrote some, some code, it's on GitHub, uh, and my, my account on GitHub, which is a simulator that runs on my laptop, which pretends it's running up to 100,000 microservices on my laptop. Each microservice is a separate Go routine, and they chat to each other, and they, they generate output as if they were real services talking to each other with, you know, obviously a lot of stuff faked, right? And I can simulate something like a load balancer, some API proxy, some zones. I can do multiple regions. And then I can simulate a Cassandra cluster copying the data back and forth underneath. That's kind of in there already. Um, and I said I could eventually stress test real tools. Well, last week, somebody came out of Stealth that's been using this to actually stress test the user interface for this, a, a new monitoring tool. They've been generating interesting configurations and trying to visualize them. And that's one of the places I want to go with this. So what happens when things fail in these environments? Well, here's that diagram again. Three availability zones. That's why it looks kind of like a jellyfish. If you wiggle this around on the screen, it, it wiggles very nicely. Okay. It's a D3 has this sort of nice wiggly motion. Um, so what happens if we lose a zone? So it looks like that, right? So what's the current state of this? Um, what, what, should you, what would your monitoring tool do if a third of your infrastructure just disappeared, right? It'd probably scream at you, you'd get deluged in alerts, everyone would be running around with their hair on fire going, what the hell's going on, right? Um, this is actually not an outage for a Netflix architecture system. It's designed to run on a two out of three model. It, the Cassandra keeps working, everything's still running. This is a single alert that says, by the way, warning, 
you've lost all your redundancy, but you're still running, right? Customers might have had a few you know, minutes of retries or something, but everything is still running. Like, probably stop updating stuff. Don't break anything else, right? So that's, that's a very different kind of um, outcome. And I don't actually know any tools right now that can do that level of understanding of the, what's really going on underneath. So this means you understand the architecture of what you're running on as a pattern in the microservice world, and you export that up. So that's the challenge, try to understand these patterns. And then I, I came up with this thing I call the tragic quadrant because everything's in the bottom left corner. So magic quadrants are kind of the Gartner thing, but this is kind of tragic. Um, which is ability to scale for monitoring tools versus ability to handle rapidly changing microservices. So along the bottom, hundreds to thousands of machines. Most monitoring tools will handle hundreds of machines. A few of them will handle thousands of machines. There are really very few that you could buy publicly you know, that will handle hundreds of thousands to, to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. So I think you know, the SignalFX guys are trying to push across here into that next generation monitoring box. You see them outside. Um, going up this, data center tools, they assume machines are gonna sit in the same place for three years, roughly. Um, once you get to cloud and virtualized environments, things are changing by the hour. So a lot of tools have figured that out. So if Datadog, I'd put kind of at the top of this. You know, they, they understand cloud, they understand virtualization. But once you get to containers, there's just a few tools like you know, New Relic and App Dynamics have just started monitoring containers. Um, and a few other tools that just kind of can see the containers, but then they're not really dealing with the fact that things are changing very rapidly. And then when you get to Lambda, I don't think there are really any tools out there right now where if you have a bunch of your business logic implement in Lambda, most tools won't be able to tell you anything about it. So, but in the top right corner, you've got, you know, the things that AWS had to build, the things Netflix had to build, the things Twitter had to build, all these in-house frameworks that are very custom-built, high-end systems because, you know, if I have 100,000 machines to monitor, I have to have something. So I had to build that internal Facebook thing that they built. Right. So there's some interesting things happening as, as tools try to get out of that bottom left quadrant and, and move into these other spaces. So just wrapping up here. So what's happening next? Where are we going? Um, I have a conference I'm running in London next month. Uh, it's called Go to London. And I'm trying to address some of these concerns. I think that people need to understand, to develop a conference, developers need to understand how to be more agile, more lean, and more rugged. So faster, cheaper, and safer is another way of saying agile, lean, and rugged. Um, that's, that's what the conference is themed about. If anybody um, has friends in London or colleagues in London, very happy to, if you can send people to this. Okay, we have some people over there. Going, we have some Londoners, cool. Um, yeah, we, we're, it's a brand new conference. We're still trying to get it, get it on the map as a thing, so you know, we'd, we'd like a lot of more people to go to it. Uh, but really trying to address some of these concerns. And then here's, a, here's really the kind of the two key books that, that are important right now. Lean Enterprise, how big organizations are scaling. All of the things that they're struggling with are in that book. And then the other one by Sam Newman, Building Microservices. If you're trying to pick apart that MySQL server and break it up into, you know, break off the tables, details on that, how to re, re, rebuild your, your development pipelines, all, all of the really good hands-on information is in that book. And finally, one of the things that um, I've been having fun with is, is the Go programming language. I found that almost everything that's new is written in Go nowadays. Um, and I, I started, I had to go, I better go learn this language and discovered why. It's very frictionless for getting stuff done. So I've been having fun building my little monitoring tool, my, my simulation tool in Go. So I think that um, you know, these are the sort of trends that I'm seeing, um, interesting things to go play with. So um, I've got like a minute and a half left for Q&A if anyone wants to have, have a conversation. And then it's like a word from our sponsors thing. These are the companies that, I, in, that Battery Ventures has invested in. So if you want to hear talk about any of these, happy to chat to you about them later. Any questions? Anyone out there? You all had enough, want to go home, get on your planes? <laughs> okay then. All right, thanks very much, and uh, see you again sometime.